I got a message from a former student of ours uh, this week talking about wanting to get back into training, has been really keen discussing it with his partner uh, quite often, almost daily, really wants to get back to it, but a little bit of hesitation um, due to the fact that he has had a bit of a layoff now, uh, feels like there's the risk of getting injured, um, you know, doesn't want to miss out on work and things like that potentially. Um, and then fitness level as well. So this video is going to be about giving some tips on how to come back to training after an extended layoff or even how to start training if you've never gotten into jujitsu or any kind of martial art, but in particular grappling arts because it is a little bit different, the, the kind of fitness requirements and the skill set and stuff like that. So first tip I would say is make sure that you know why you want to train because there's lots of different arts and then within those arts there's lots of different styles as well. So you may have seen the UFC, you may have gotten into an argument with somebody at the shopping centre or been cut off in traffic, uh, you may have watched martial arts films when you were younger and idolised the actors and, and loved the scenes and all that sort of stuff. So there's lots of different reasons that you might want to get into training. The number one tip would be find out what it is and have a good hard think about what you actually want to do with your training, okay? Because most of us, we kind of have a bit, a bit of an idea, but until we start and we sort of go down that rabbit hole, we don't necessarily know exactly why we want to train. We just know that we're drawn to the art or the sport for some reason. So if your goals are self-defense, try to find an art where that's more of an emphasis. Okay, and that could be on boxing, it could be on like a Krav Maga or a modern combatives technique, um, like kinetic fighting, it could be a grappling based situation, something like that. But think about what it is that you actually want to do. And then from there, make sure you do your research. Because again, there's often quite a big disconnect. People watch the UFC or they've been in an argument and they have this picture of what training is or self-defense is for them and, and what they want to achieve and then they go somewhere like a jiu-jitsu club and all of a sudden they're, you know, they're doing spider guard or inverted techniques and you know, things like this where they would then look at that and go, well, how am I ever going to apply this where I'm spinning upside down trying to do a bear and bowler? How am I going to use this in a real life situation? And that's not to say that sport jiu-jitsu techniques can't be effective in the real world. Um, obviously, you know, a, a decent Brazilian jiu-jitsu person has probably got a better chance than a non-trained person in a self-defense situation, but there are things that we potentially have to tweak and change and make a little bit different to make it more real world applicable. So make sure that you then do your research, find out, okay, is this uh, Taekwondo school going to be effective if I want to learn grappling? No, probably not. You know, if I want to learn self-defense, is this sport-based jiu-jitsu club going to give me the best options? Because there are differences that need to be taken into consideration. So number one tip would be figure out with yourself, sit down, why do you actually want to start training? The second tip is then do your research. Okay, Most clubs have some kind of a free trial, at least it might be a class, a couple classes a week, something like that, so you can go in, you can find out what they're about, have a chat to the instructor, you can observe some of the classes. Even if you don't train, just go and sit in and watch. Um, and you can go from there, okay? And you can get a bit of a feel and go, okay, well, you know, that type of training that I was doing here probably more closely aligns to what I had envisaged compared to this type of training over here. All right, so do your research, make sure that you find a club that matches your needs with what you actually want to achieve uh, and what they do. Now the next tip that I would say for people who have either just started or maybe had a long break, like most of us have had at least a couple months off now because of the COVID crisis. So I would say to you, at the lesser experienced end of the scale, it's gonna be more of an issue coming back to the people who are more experienced. So you get someone who's trained for 10 years they're going to be able to ease back into training probably a little bit easier than someone who's got six months, a year, a couple of years worth of training. And the big thing there is that the more experienced you get, you tend to be able to modulate, so to be able to regulate up and down how much energy you're expending. So 
for me, for instance, as a black belt, I've trained for long enough and I've been in enough situations that I have a pretty decent understanding now of when to relax and when to use energy. However, if I have a new student who comes in and they start training with me, they may not know when they can relax, so they tend to use their strength all the time. And especially this is really, really common in your kind of unfamiliar, uncomfortable position. So if someone gets the mount on you and you're not used to being mounted, a natural response is you try and do everything that you can to get out of that mount all the time. You spend the entire time you're mounted fighting, 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 trying to get out. Now you mount somebody who's a black belt or someone who's trained for a few years, for instance, they're probably more likely to relax, stay in that position until they need to escape. Because if someone's mounted on you and they're not doing anything, especially if it's in a sport context where they're not throwing strikes or anything like that, and it's not a, you know, a real life fight out in the real world, you can kind of sit there. If they're not submitting you, yeah, you might have got points scored against you, but you've already got them potentially, so now there's no point wasting your energy. If they're not hitting you, don't waste your energy. If they're not attacking you, don't waste your energy. So a really big thing is actually knowing how to conserve energy and when to conserve energy. And obviously that comes with more and more experience. You know, that's something that has to be learned on the mat. But the art of trying to stay relaxed is super important. And that could be when you're in an offensive position. Again, you might want to try and push the pace and you think, oh, I'm going to get my first tap on this person. You know, I've got the mount, I've got the back. I've been working on this choke, now's the time, this is going to be the first time I get to tap someone. And you might expend all of your energy trying to get this choke in and then miss it. And now you've pretty much exhausted yourself while you're in a really good position. Whereas again, you, you f have somebody who's a bit more experienced, they're more likely to play more of a slow, long game. And this is sometimes seen with, you know, you, you guys on the lower end of the experience spectrum, maybe a couple of years training at most, and you'll actually get tapped maybe more by them than you will the black belt or the brown belt or the purple belt who's trained for a few years. Because what'll happen is the guy who's trained for a few months, maybe a year or two, he really wants to get that submission. Okay, so they're going to be putting in all their effort on that choke, they're gonna go, and if they don't get it, they're gonna be completely burnt out, but they might hold on, grind on the face, you know, really get that windpipe choke, do anything they can to get it, whereas the person with more experience is more likely to go, nah, it's not really on, I'll go to something else. And then they might switch to the arm or they might try and go to the back or transition to another position, something like that. And so you might find you actually get tapped less by the person with more experience than you do the person with less experience because they're conserving their energy they're moving around, they're giving you different options. So really focus when you do get back to training on that conservation of energy and relax as much as humanly possible. A really big part of that is actually being able to put your ego aside. And we talk about this all the time in Jiu Jitsu. Okay? The idea that if you can not have your ego so prevalent when you train, you're not so concerned on being tapped, you're not so concerned on getting taps, you're more in it to actually learn and get better and grow. It's really, really hard, and this is why so many people quit, okay? But if you can manage to do that, you'll find that now, because my ego is not screaming at me to tap the guy out, now I'll relax a little bit more because I don't care so much in training if I get the tap or not. And because I don't care so much, I don't put as much energy into it, if I don't put as much energy into it, now I don't use up all of my capacity and fatigue after the first minute or two. Okay, so a really big thing is just knowing it's really, really hard. I understand that it's really hard, but trying to say to yourself, it doesn't matter if I tap, doesn't matter if I tap the other person. This is training, this is about learning, this isn't about winning, this isn't about dominating somebody else and proving I'm the best. That's what fights are for, that's what competitions are for. Okay, if you want to go out there and you want to prove to yourself and to other people that you're the best, fantastic, more power to you. But do it in competition where everyone else is trying to do the same thing. Don't do it in training where potentially you've got someone who's had a bad day. 
they're tired, they're just turning up because they just want to get out of the house. Maybe somebody's injured, maybe someone's less experienced, more experienced, all these other factors that come into play that you don't potentially know when you're at training. So while you're trying to crush someone, they might just be trying to relax. And that's not to say you can't do it, but if your ego gets too big where if you don't crush that person or if they turn around and tap you, you get really annoyed, you go home and you, you know it affects your mood, things like that, that's where it becomes problematic. And that's where a lot of people don't come back to training after a while because their ego doesn't allow them to be the nail for 10 years before they become the hammer. See if you can control the training environment. And so by that I mean a lot of people come back to training and they instantly go straight into sparring. Okay, and so maybe they haven't trained ever or maybe they haven't trained in a few months. They do really hard warm up where they're doing burpees and they're running and they're doing hip escapes up and down the mat and they're doing takedown entries like Uchi Komi stuff. And they do a few techniques where they kind of don't really put a lot of effort in because they're tired from the warm up. They get their second win, they're thrown into rolling straight away and all of a sudden after one or two rolls, they're gone, they're done. Okay, they're completely exhausted. Ease into it and try to do sort of situational training. So positional sparring, fight simulation stuff where you can narrow the focus down and know what's coming. Okay, because if you've never boxed before and you get thrown into sparring on day one, if you don't know what punches are coming, it's hard for you to parry, to block, to move your head if you don't know what's coming. But if you know the only punch that your partner is going to throw is a left jab, then you can prepare for that much better. Okay, so you know you can move, you can slip, you can move around, you can block it, you can shell up. It's much easier to defend than if it's too open. And so you can apply that same logic with your jiu-jitsu. So you can go, okay, hey, can we just work on guard passing? That's what we did in the class today. So while everyone else is doing their normal roles, you can say to your partner, do you mind if I start in your spider guard, half guard, closed guard, butterfly guard, whatever it happened to be that you worked on on that day, and just work on that passing. Okay? That way, if you get submitted, if you get swept, you're not actually often as phased because it's not a real role in that sense. So the ego is often diminished as well. But you're also working on that specific thing that you've just trained and it's much more controlled. Five tips on getting into jiu-jitsu or starting again after a long layoff. Tip number one, do your research within yourself. Why do you want to train? Okay, figure out your own goals. Number two, try and match those to a club. So again, do your research, find a club that will actually help you achieve what you want to achieve. Number three, when you start off, try and relax, try to keep it playful, as the saying goes, conserve your energy. Number four, put the ego aside, okay? The training room is for training and learning, it's not necessarily for competition. That's what competitions are for. And number five, the last tip is try and structure your training so that you can actually get the most out of it. Ease in with things like positional sparring, drilling, doing your reps, that way you're working on your timing and your technique without necessarily getting smashed or exhausted.